Hey, and welcome back to another The Boys Breakdown. This time with episode 5, we gotta go now. We've got The Seven filming a Justice League-esque film, and all this craziness happening with Black Noir, so let's just get into it. So we start off with The Dawn of the Seven, and even more references to Justice League, with it just the color grading being so brown is very clearly Zack Snyder, and also the whole line that Homelander throws out about the, the rewrite. <laughs> which was pretty great the new joss rewrite yeah we th there were a couple of things in this episode um that went past being subtle to not that it was ever subtle but uh was made explicit you know uh uh dawn of the seven uh justice league batman v superman dawn of justice it's all connected etc but yeah when when uh homelander mentions the joss rewrite it's like oh okay so it's literally like a joss whedon Zack snyder joke cool can't wait for the snyder cut haha <laughs> i hope they do that but we get a major event <laughs> right afterwards which is cell phone footage of homelander killing a soup terrorist and accidentally killing a civilian and just i, I love his whole attitude during the whole thing where he just flies in doesn't give a crap at all mentions how yeah. grimy and dirty it is He's awful, but it's it's a side of him that uh, most people don't normally see, which is interesting yeah. because we're, we're we live with this character being this complete monster, and so so we're not surprised, we're not shocked by that, but we see people's reaction to it, uh, obviously. Yeah, and we get something that you touched on in the past, and like you said, things are really clear cut in this episode which is that Homelander really, really cares about the people's adoration of him, uh, and it really matters to him a lot. And it's kind of been, you know, shown a little bit before, but this is 100%, like, he is so upset to find out that people don't like him, that people are protesting him. Like, he's he's not at all okay with it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting seeing this conflict inside of him because you can see all of his, his urges and, and his instincts are to just be evil he just he hates people <laughs> yeah um but he wants them to love him and this is like we're getting into almost prototypical supervillain motivations right like uh ruling through fear and he's he's edging closer to that and this, the, the interactions between him and Stormfront in this episode are so interesting because, if anything, she kind of pulls him back from the edge. Like, he's fantasizing about literally just murdering crowd, a crowd of people who are yeah. protesting him. And she presents him uh, with, with a, you know, with an alternative. With him specifically, we really do get a lot more of his motivation because we know about his background. And his whole issue is being raised in a lab. You can really piece that together and say, okay, well, why does he love so much, or why does he care so much about the people's adoration? And it's got to be his character reaching out for some sort of love, some sort of, you know, psychological adoration from people because he didn't have that growing up, right? Yeah. Like that. That's kind of where those pieces align. There's also um, the the Maeve stuff this episode. Her, yeah. uh, her, her, like this movie that they're filming seems so awful and it's obviously <laughs> deliberately so cheesy and terrible um but mike but the <laughs> girls get it done girls get it done girls get it done this episode answered one of our questions from last episode when we were mm. so horrified to see homelander publicly out uh mave on tv which is what has he done with elena um and so i i was relieved to just see her suddenly appear in a scene and it almost made me think that we were maybe being a little bit too paranoid um like the show didn't seem to think that we as the audience would think that elena had been harmed by homelander yet uh because they just she just kind of was there uh right it wasn't yeah. like a big like it we didn't get a scene of like queen Maeve frantically calling her to see if she was okay uh we didn't get any reveal that she was that she was alive still right but they did have Maeve question what he did to her so I and mean, that's as mm -hmm. an audience what led us to thinking that but just to go down this path a little bit too we get Vaught throwing them through the PR ringer and something that we see companies do you know, on both sides where they're trying to use these social issues of today to promote their company yeah these these two marketing bozos uh it's not their first appearance right we saw them in season one um when they debuted Starlight's 
um, skimpy new outfit that uh, yeah. you know, everybody loves loves so much. Um, this is this is typical of Vought, like Ashley's management of of the seven under Vought. Like we saw the focus group earlier uh, this season with the supervillain uh, versus super terrorist stuff. In episode one, even when she was introducing Homelander to Blindspot, she mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having a differently abled uh, uh, hero in the seven because um, inclusion and diversity are really big with millennials right now. Like marketing speak and focus testing everything to death rules the way that Ashley sees this stuff. And so this, none of this is surprising from that point of view. I think some of the some of their ideas aren't bad, right? Um, if Queen Maeve and Elena were on board with becoming this gay power couple or whatever, but clearly they're not. Yeah. And I think one of the worst things that they said was, you know, Americans don't can't accept uh, two female lesbians. They they have to conform to male and female gender roles, even if they're both gay. Well, that and also Maeve being bisexual, and then being like, "Oh no, no, that's not okay. That's not right. Like, we can't, what's... we can't mention that either. Like, right, right. Like they, that's... they don't care at all about Maeve and Elena. It's just another marketing ploy for them. Right, and I think that's what makes it dirty. Is you know, think what you want about real life companies doing this sort of thing. But what makes it dirty from Vought's perspective is it's very clear that all they care about is the marketing points. Maybe I guess is the last one of the last draws for Maeve. Um, clearly Maeve is aware that Homelander is is kind of the driving force behind all this, having outed her and, and now in, enjoying uh, manipulating the whole situation. All of the rewrites happening to the movie in real time to reflect the things that are happening yeah. um, to the Seven in, re in their actual lives are hilarious to me. I don't understand how this movie can be both the dawn of the Seven but also <laughs> when when <laughs> when A Train retires from the seven, <laughs> it might be the dawn of the seven. The sunset on A Train. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the line. It's such a um, cheesy line, but what is the timeline here? Like, when, <laughs> we, we what is the timeline within the fiction of the movie within the show? Yeah. Because we got during the stupid uh, pitch from the writer director guy. He's like, "This is the moment that the seven became the seven. But it's like. A train immediately quits. Yeah, and also we know through this episode that A train wasn't even the first runner on the team. There's someone called I think Marathoner, something to that extent. Yeah, Mr. Um, Mar that's a really good that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up. So Ashley mentions Mr. Marathon as A train's predecessor. Um, I don't believe he's been mentioned in the show before. In the comics, he was another speedster. He was A train's predecessor, uh, and he died before the events of the of the comics so we uh, we see him in flashbacks in the comics it's just yeah. a little easter egg but it just made me think about we really don't know anything about the real forming of the seven about who the real original members were you know you kind of get going to the show and you just assume this is who they are and just like the justice league you kind of think like, oh, these are all the original members. We get a couple scenes with Starlight um, and Stormfront now that Starlight knows the truth about Stormfront. And Stormfront is playing this really weird angle with Starlight in a way where she befriends Starlight's mom out of nowhere, <laughs> uh, which is kind of creepy, but um, through it sounds like through talking to Starlight's mom, she's able to confirm something that Stormfront was probably suspicious about which is how did compound v get leaked and you know we never saw anything before stormfront noticed gecko before but she didn't say anything um starlight hid the compound v in stormfront's backpack and it's you know entirely possible that stormfront saw the compound v at some point in her backpack and just didn't say anything yeah, I think Stormfront's just been sort of uh, playing it cool, but has been noticing all of these things. I, I have a lot of questions about Storm... Like, if Stormfront was just fishing for um, information with Starlight's mom and just wanted to maybe confirm, like, how upset Starlight was about it, maybe mm -hmm. find out if Starlight had the, the motivation for it, I don't see why she would have brought her to set unless to kind of stoke this uh, confrontation between Starlight and her mom. So I don't understand. I don't. I don't know what her angle is, and I feel that way about most of what Stormfront does in this episode. 
except for the Homelander stuff, which we'll get into. But I don't understand yeah. why she is brokering this confrontation between Starla and her mother. I don't understand why she's antagonizing A-Train with all of this loaded uh, language about certain types of people being garbage or whatever. Um, she seems to be manipulating several different people to several different ends. And yeah. I just... I haven't yet been able to piece together what her overall, uh, you know, evil plan is. I feel like with Stormfront and A Train, it's just Stormfront basically gloating over A Train in the way that she can because, you know, we know she's super racist. That's clear. And <laughs> yeah. now, and now she's she's almost evolved right over time in the sense of she's not going to be super racist when she like outwardly when she can't be. But this is the sort of language that you hear people saying when they don't want you to totally know, right? That, yeah, that they're yeah, being yeah, racist. Yeah. The, so the she's, term she's is dog, the term is uh, dog whistles. So she's she's okay, saying things yeah. that are not overtly racist, but racist people understand that you're signaling to them, uh, you know, you and I are are, are alike. Right, and A Train obviously picks up on it, but you know, she. I think for her, because A Train's about to be out of the seven. Like, I really think she's just having her moment to gloat because she can't be as outwardly racist as she usually is. So yeah. I, I don't know. That would be my guess with that. Th this brings up this question of um, how much of what Stormfront is doing is part of Stan Edgar's larger machinations and how much of it is just her enjoying, you know, being an evil uh, racist Nazi. Um, because yeah, we, yeah. we see after after Starlight infiltrates her um, trailer later on, um, you know, obviously we looked very closely at this one shot of Stormfront's emails. It's yeah. mostly out of focus, but there's a lot that we can determine from that. Um, I'll point out a couple of obvious things. All of the emails are from Stan Edgar, mm -hmm. um, and most of them relate to Sage Grove. Yeah. Um, which is a thing that we can talk about in a second. But my point is, obviously, Stan Edgar is working closely with Stormfront, and I would, you know, hazard a, a bet that the Homelander, her manipulating Homelander and getting him on her, on her side is all part of that larger scheme. Um, yeah. What, what does the stuff with Starlight and the stuff with A-Train have to do with that? Is that just Stormfront enjoying being a piece of shit? <laughs> or is that all part of it as well? I don't know. Delamonte Robinson in the comments brought up an interesting point that I've seen other people mention too, which is shouldn't Edgar know she's a liberty and like super racist and will turn on him because of his race? And I do think that's a interesting point because why would Stan Edgar... I mean, clearly Stormfront's being extremely loyal to him in the moment, but yeah, she's super racist. So it's, it's interesting that Stan Edgar would choose her. You know, I would be surprised if the show doesn't address it at some point. Stan Edgar clearly has his own goals, right? There's one thing that I think could trump any divisions between Stormfront and Stan Edgar that, as, as a result of her views and his race, and that's mm -hmm. the general pursuit of money and power, right? Like, yeah. he, he, he's, he, he has his own goals, and he very likely just doesn't care. Let's talk about uh, Sean Ashmore. There were reports from earlier uh, this year that Sean Ashmore had been cast to play Lamplighter, who, uh, if you have been paying attention to the show's history, you know that Lamplighter was a former member of the Seven um, in the first episode of, of season one of the series um, when Starlight is introduced uh, Vought is doing a tribute to the Lamplighter to mm -hmm. coincide with his retirement. Um, at the time, I kind of assumed that that meant his death, and they just don't like to admit when superheroes mm. uh, have died. But it, uh, it turns out that he actually retired from the Seven um, yeah. because we're seeing him here. So, yeah, this is Lamplighter. This is the guy who killed Mallory's uh, grandkids and caused the boys to break up in the first place prior to the events of the show. And, uh, uh, yeah, we just don't... I personally have... have no idea what he's up to. 
Mike, I got a question for you. Um, mm. So his lighter says Titty Committee on it. Like, is that a clue? <laughs> like, I, I'm just wondering because the the way I figured out it was Lamplighter was because I just looked up like who the actor was. And it just turned out he was cast as Lamplighter. That's how I was able to find it. But since, like, is that something from the comics? Uh, yeah, so I knew he was Lamplighter because I just saw that news earlier this summer. So I kept, I've been okay. waiting all season for them for them to introduce him. Uh, the Lighter, I don't know if uh, uh, Titty Committee specifically is a reference to anything. However, uh, the fact that he has a lighter because they don't say who he is in this episode so i would say that him yeah. having a lighter is a clue uh i have no no doubt next week that'll that'll be revealed uh that he's yeah. lamplighter so it's it's not going to be like a long running mystery or anything a couple things that we want to note here is that sage grove we looked it up um pretty much consistently in search results sage grove is an elderly living center um i think it like it also kind of looked like an asylum to me and we get this quote that uh, is interesting from them, which is... No one ever said the job was easy. Look, he's just a kid. 17 years old, you don't gotta look him in the face. Look, no one's ever achieved anything without sacrifice. The kid's a hero. Think of it like that. Do you have, Do you have any, any theories? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I asked you, I asked you first. <laughs> okay, yes, actually. So uh, I was doing, I was looking into what the emails were. Um, and mm -hmm. I found that if you really read the emails, one says updated ADR slash AE report. And I looked that up. An ADR report typically means an adverse drug reaction report. An AE report mm -hmm. is typically an adverse event report. Some other emails said that it was uh, like a phase on the timeline or timetable and Sage Grove is at an 82% success. We know that compound V being used on adults almost always kills them. So... Uh, my thoughts are that they're testing some sort of new drug, either it be Compound V or like some new version of Compound V, or maybe even something that takes away powers, which would be interesting. So my thought is that maybe the kid that they're talking about is someone who they tested this drug on. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm impressed uh, how well you were able to like CSI zoom in on those emails because I, I didn't glean that much from those blurry screenshots. Enhance. Um, <laughs> uh, this does bring up a comment that someone had Stan Stockton uh, mentioned Stan Edgar means to distribute Compound V this is why he smiled when he heard that knowledge of Compound V was released to the public his eventual goal is to distribute Compound V on the consumer market I mean that could be the case maybe they're maybe that's what they're doing here is they're making some sort of consumer grade Compound V that they can sell for a lot of money uh, the fact that they want to sell to the military to me would make you can make more money on the military than not have everybody have powers because if everyone has it then it's not special anymore right yeah i was, oh, I was gonna say that so, would just be utter chaos yeah um it, yeah. it also is kind of goes against the general mission of of pharmaceutical companies uh that get to just run rampant under raw capitalism which is to make as much money as possible regardless i mean it, it's we've pointed out before that compound v has many more applications beyond just giving people weird abilities uh yeah. prolonging life potentially curing disease stimulating healing people could regrow limbs with compound v for all we know um so so maybe this all has something to do with that um that said i would be surprised if stan edgar's plan ultimately is to distribute it widely uh because right now it's their most precious asset yeah and so i would think that his 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 plan is a, a more uh, more calculated than that dave since we're on the topic of the seven still i have a question for you what do you think stormfront meant when she told starlight that starlight is going to be a big help to her that's a great question and Thank you. I don't have a theory this time. I have no idea. Do you have any thoughts on it? <laughs> My only thought is that, um, much like Homelander, uh, Starlight is kind of like a Nazi wet dream of like a, a, a an idealized Aryan person, mm. you know, with fair skin, blonde hair, beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so depending how effectively Stormfront is able to manipulate Star Starlight um, and just how much of a literal Nazi uh, Stormfront is, which I still think that reveal is coming. Yeah. Uh, Starlight could pot 
potentially, you know, I, I, I she wouldn't be happy about this, but for Stormfront to manipulate her into into being used as this symbol for whatever whatever uh, movement Stormfront is is brewing would be uh, uh, fucking diabolical, as as Butcher would say. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's got to be something like that. But Stormfront I, does end up seducing a Homelander this episode. Uh, we get that scene from the trailer that we've been talking about where... Laser my tits. Yeah. Oh, man. Out of context, like, if this was a different show where they weren't so evil, their, um, like, rough superhero sex scene would have been a ton of fun. <laughs> I enjoyed them throwing each other around and, like, burning each other's skin. And stuff. Yeah, normally be like, oh, yeah, sick. And that, this one, you're just, like, thinking about how horrible it is the whole time. You're like, oh, no, no, this is going to be so yeah. bad. No, this is going to be so bad. I mean, I was I was literally, I was watching it going, okay, so, you know, think, thinking about our, our current political situation uh, yeah. and, and how we got here and some of the, some of the you know, alt-right online troll moments, uh, movements of the last few mm. years. And I'm sitting here going, okay, Homelander is literally like a proto-American fascist who is being seduced and then radicalized by an actual Nazi using the power of memes. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, another example of this show not exactly being subtle, but... I think crafting this incredibly accurate and effective metaphor when you boil it down to to just those basic parts. And that's largely in real life because of outside influence as well. And so I think the reveal that relates to Stan Edgar's uh, story about Frederick Vaught from one of the earlier season two episodes that uh, he likely, the founder of Vaught likely brought Stormfront with him literally from Nazi Germany, which you know would make her literally a uh, a foreign power manipulating this American symbol, I think, would just be extremely appropriate. Now we have Stormfront and Homelander joining forces. They are now officially mm-hmm. Stormlander. And <laughs> on the we can't call them Homefront because that's a game series. Yes, so we'll go Stormlander. Uh, but <laughs> on the flip side, Maeve is now actually stepping, taking a stand against Homelander, and. Um, she specifically goes to reach out to the Deep, but it's very likely, as you noted, that A-Train might join her as well, because now he has beef with Homelander, um, where there, there's this faction divide or being created, this division. What did you think of the stuff with, uh, between the, uh, the Deep and the Church of the Collective this episode? Oh, we got Alistair Adana. Um, uh-huh. So... Look, I mean, all of it's very clearly a reference to Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. Um, that's 100% what they're doing with the media tour of it. But uh, more specifically, I was intrigued by the fact that we got Alistair being introduced this episode. So um, that's going to be another element, I'm sure, that we're going to see in the next few episodes. Yeah, the, the Scientology stuff is all pretty clear cut. Um, the the Alistair stuff is, is interesting to me. He's not a comics character, but... Uh, that's another one that we've been waiting for simply because uh, we saw the casting news uh, mm-hmm. before the season came out. So so we're definitely... He was mentioned earlier. We talked about that. So uh, we're expecting a little bit more from him. Anyway, back on topic, we're seeing these factions take shape. It's interesting because yep. in the comics, um, the the boys have all been injected with Compound V. And it's, one, it, it's a big plot point in the books. They all have super strength and they f- literally fight the soups constantly. Uh, and, they, and they come to blows and they kill soups all the time. And and that really hasn't come through in the show. I mean, we'll talk about it in a second, but we saw what happens when they fight Black Noir. It doesn't go well for them. Um, no. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're so slowly seeing other members of the Seven, starting with Starlight, uh, potentially now A-Train, who's been fired, the mm. Deep, who's disillusioned and is being recruited by Maeve. Maeve, who is, uh, you know, she, her hand is being forced because Homelander has now put Elena in danger. So we're seeing all of these other members of the Seven c- kind of be forced over to not, they're not, you know, going to suddenly become allies with the boys, but the enemy of, of their enemy is their friend. As in, I see the potential for um, some unique team-ups happening in the future. For my part, I hope they don't inject the boys with Compound V or a variation of it, just because the underdog factor is part of what I enjoy. Dave, can we uh, can we talk about Terror? 
Yes, yes, let's talk about Terror. Because <laughs> uh, Terror is a very good boy. So this, this episode <laughs> is full of stuff from the comics. Like, almost, almost every scene had some reference to the comics or uh, some storyline from the comics kind of being woven in here. Um, uh, the Frenchie and Kamiko stuff uh, is is almost all from the comics. So in the comics, uh, Kamiko is the female. Uh, she doesn't really have a name, but when mm. she's not fighting soups with the boys, she's doing hits for the mob because she has this like insatiable bloodlust, and she always has to be murdering someone, and she rips people's faces all the time. Even the dialogue in that scene uh, where they're talking about how she's just a girl and she's not running the head, all that stuff is, is literally right off the page. So that was interesting. Mm. More importantly, uh, terror. Terror is <laughs> omnipresent in the comics. He he's there from the beginning. He goes everywhere with Butcher. He uh, f-ks on command. He f-ks other dogs. He f-ks people that Butcher tells him to. F-. Uh, and and he's just this. He's just this presence. And so I think maybe the show's greatest crime is uh, waiting this long to introduce him because he's the yeah. Best. Terror is great, and not only Terror, but we also find out about Lenny from Butcher's past, who is Butcher's brother. Who we know he died. We don't know how, but um, yeah. We also find uh, Butcher's aunt. So a whole lot of Butcher family and backstory starting to peel back uh, and come to us in these scenes. Yeah, we've been getting a lot of backstory. We got we got Mother's Milk backstory uh, in a previous episode. We're getting the Butcher backstory. Lenny is from the comics, although not as interesting as the sh- the show is kind of now because of the timing of the dialogue a little bit. Uh, Aunt Judy got cut off uh, when she maybe was about to say how Lenny died. Uh, I I love the reveal of Black Noir in this episode though, when Butcher mm. looks in his uh, mirror and sees Black Noir hiding on the, the ceiling on the roof. I was like, oh, that's so badass. My thought was uh, Black Noir is kind of a sh- ninja. I know. I was thinking that too. Like he's a he's a terrible ninja. <laughs> he gets hit by every single booby trap. He's spotted uh-huh. by Butcher. He's he's a terrible. Yeah, I agree with you. I was thinking that too. He's not a good ninja. Uh, you spotted some really cool Easter eggs in in the scene where they're waiting for Black Noir to come and set off the traps, um, where the the clock is set to seven p.m. And yeah. one of the cards, the playing cards that they use in the traps uh, is a seven of hearts. So lots of seven references. I just thought that those were, uh, you know, good job. Because I didn't you. notice Yeah, those. it's just some fun nods. Um, yeah, so after all the booby traps are set off and everything, though, uh, we find out some really big stuff with Black Noir. Huge, huge Black Noir reveal. We, we haven't known anything about him in the past. And now we find out that he's Stan Edgar's dog, essentially. Like he, everything that he did was purely Stan Edgar behind it. He even has a camera on his face mask. <laughs> so Stan Edgar can watch every single thing. So you got to think like anytime that Black Noir has been in a meeting with the Seven, Stan Edgar can see and hear everything going on. Like anytime Black Noir is anywhere. So I, I feel that's like that's interesting. huge. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, cer- certainly this answers our question from last episode, which is why does Black Noir care about Butcher, why is he doing this? And it turns yeah. out, oh, it's just coming from Stan Edgar. Much like with Stormfront, all of this sketchy stuff that's that's going on, that like even mm-hmm. Stormfront's uh, anti vot rallies, um, that and this and who knows what else is really all Stan Edgar manipulating things uh, from the background um, without, you know, coming into direct contact with any of these plots. Um, that said, it was interesting for him and Butcher to to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Do you think that Butcher actually does have photos, or do you think he was just bluffing? Because even though he told Huey he does, I was still like, eh, he could be bluffing. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think he does. Like the there was a look that was shared between Butcher and Huey, um, and, and to me, that's the kind of person butcher is right butcher breaks into this compound to try and and rescue rescue becca and get her out um but to me butcher is the kind of person who who has a backup plan he prepares for an eventuality so he he hid in becca's car we don't know how long he was there if he's hiding out outside of becca's Mm -hmm. house i would bet money that he would be uh hedging his bets and, and taking some photos while he's there yeah, so he mentions that he, you know, he's going to release these photos on a server if Stan Edgar kills him or anyone in the mm-hmm. boys. And 
it was specifically something I noticed because, I mean, outside of it being important, but, like, last week, you had brought up, like, why doesn't Butcher do this? Why doesn't he just threaten to go public? <laughs> um, so you basically, again, once again, predicted something that was going to happen just in a slightly different way. Honestly, reading the comics a lot helps with <laughs> uh, with this stuff. Um, there, there, This also echoes a comic book storyline um, where, you know, because the boys have these this these compound v super strength powers mm. um th- there's a much greater threat of an actual confrontation between the seven and the the boys um and but it's a mutually assured destruction because the seven yeah. would defeat the boys because they are the most powerful soups in existence um while at the same time uh as in this episode uh the boys have these photos that show homelander d- doing some horrible atrocities that I won't get into the details of. It's an interesting way to sort of uh, maintain the tension between the boys and the seven when in reality, if if Butcher hadn't had this backup plan, Blackmore could have just murdered them all now and the show would be over. Right. So the boys though, we end with the boys having in a way a little more power because of these photos that Butcher supposedly has. We now have a breaking of factions in the seven even further. Uh, another rift going on and we're setting up for what could potentially be a big seven suit battle uh in the next few episodes at some point all right well thank you guys so much for joining us uh let us know your comments as always below on what you thought once again i'm dave klein joined by mike rougeau and we will see you guys next week for another episode later guys